In the last lecture, we left off with the early beginning stages of the Cold War, and you can look at the timeline and review Lecture 3 to get a sense of each one of those events. These are the key events you need to know. Um, but Europe, at this point, was being divided up amongst the Western capitalist countries and those that are aligned with the Soviet Union in what Winston Churchill called the Iron Curtain. And you could see countries like Poland and Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria. We had Turkey and Greece almost fall, and that was prevented by the Truman Doctrine, which would have given Stalin access to this strategic point, the Mediterranean Sea. We had Western Europe being rebuilt under the Marshall Plan. And while in the beginning it seemed like Truman was having success after success, uh, communism was being contained outside of Eastern Europe, there was a really close showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union that occurs. Uh, the situation quickly gets worse. And what ends up happening... is there is a conflict over Berlin. And this conflict over Berlin, the city in Germany uh, in which the German government surrenders, is going to nearly lead to a atomic war. And here's what ends up happening. You gotta go back to the end of World War II. Germany and Italy had already surrendered, and if you remember, Truman was gonna meet for the first and only time with Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill the, the big three were meeting up at a place called Potsdam. Now, random side story, Potsdam's right over here. If you take a look on the map, there's Berlin. Potsdam's not too far away. Um, and when a couple of friends of mine were in Europe, we, we were like, hey, let's go to Potsdam. We all, all three of us taught history. And here's two of us trying to get there. We, we took a night train and uh, to get to Berlin. And that is the worst pose you will ever see. This there's nothing good about this pose at all. It's just creepy. Um, I, 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 yeah, and I barely fit on the damn bed. And so once we're in Berlin, our goal is to get to Potsdam. And of course, when you're in Germany, you got to go watch Dirty Dancing and wear Russian hats. Uh, there's all sorts of randomness in Berlin. And we finally get to this palace, this great palace that's in Potsdam. It's beautiful, the garden, and there's tons of tourists, and you can go inside, and it's just a wonderful building. And we think we're at Potsdam, and then somebody tells us, no, this is not where the conference was held. Uh, because there's another place, uh, former home of a German prince, and this is the building in which the Potsdam conference was going to be held in July and August of 1945. And inside this building, inside this room, this is my photo that I was not supposed to take, and it's blurry and it's horrible, and then I realized, why did I go through all this trouble to get this photo? You could see the US, the British, and the Soviet flag on the table. Why did I struggle dodging security guards trying to snap a photo of the actual table of Potsdam so I could show all of you wonderful people online when I could just Google it and get some awesome photo that someone else took, probably legally with the perfect lighting that gives you the real vibe of this room. So this is the room where these leaders met to discuss some important issues. And here they are back in July of 1945. You have Joseph Stalin right here and you have Truman over here. Winston Churchill over at this end of the table and these guys are meeting. A little handshake going on between Truman and Stalin. They're there, they're meeting to discuss these extremely important issues. Right now in this scene they are discussing are we gonna order Chinese food or are we going going a little crazy today we're gonna get some uh, you know Korean barbecue. So really important decisions. And here's the famous image. We kept trying to find, me and my three friends, we kept trying to find the place where they did this handshake, Churchill, Truman, and Stalin, and nobody knew because probably no one goes there to find the spot where three men stood over 60 years ago to shake hands. But here's what they decide at Potsdam. They make some important agreements. And the important agreement for us, remember they tell Japan, you're going to surrender, unconditionally surrender. The atomic bomb is, is revealed to Truman um, while he's at the conference, and we issue an ultimatum. The important thing for us is they decide Germany is going to be divided. Germany is going to be divided between Great Britain, the Soviet Union, the United States, and France. And the important city of Berlin 
is going to be also divided between these four allies. France, England, America, Soviets. They're going to divide up Germany. And there's my little division symbol to help you with the visual learning. So this is the agreement they decide upon. They're going to administer Berlin and Germany by occupation. Now when the Cold War begins, because of all the conflicts we heard about, we have some problems. Because what happens is the United States, France, and England begin uniting their zones into a reunited Germany that was going to be... You gotta keep them separated. Separate from the communists, it was going to be a non-communist West Germany state. And they start to unite their zones. And, and likewise, Soviet tries to clamp down. The Stalin tries to clamp down on his section. You gotta keep them separated. And the Soviets are also kind of consolidating their control over East Germany and kind of turning it into a pro-Soviet puppet government. Now, the problem lies in the fact that... Hey, could I use your guys' phone for a sec? Is there anything wrong? I don't feel very good. The problem lies in the fact that Berlin, that city that was jointly occupied, is roughly 110 miles into the Soviet zone. And as they're kind of disagreeing in the early stages of the Cold War, no longer working together, it becomes a problem of what are you going to do with Berlin? And is Germany going to be permanently divided? Because if you permanently divide Germany, you have a different kind of map. And what are you going to do about Berlin? There's this belief that is based upon a lot of fact that Stalin is, is there to put in these pro-Soviet governments wherever and everywhere he could. Now, for Stalin, he has just cause to do this as he feels the Soviets have been attacked numerous times in the past. So the dilemma is, how do we protect Berlin? Previously, we had fought together, the Soviets, the British, the French, and the United States to rip apart the Nazi and the Axis powers. And now you have a situation where Germany is divided between these four powers and Berlin is deep inside the Soviet zone. So you got a major problem because what happens next is... In June of 1948, Stalin orders a blockade of Berlin. And blockade basically means he's not letting anybody in and he's not letting anybody out. And we're not just talking about people, we're talking about medical supplies, fuel, and all the essentials that were needed for Berlin, because Berlin, remember, was destroyed still. It had been bombed numerous times during World War II. And here's a little preview of what's going to happen next. <laughs> June 1948, the blockade begins. In fact, if you take a look at this little kind of end credit, all of these are important points to keep in mind when watching these lectures. So pause it and take a look. Can you identify them? 
Now, let me give you some facts. Let me break it down here. What, what was Truman presented with? And the facts are not good. I'm so lonely, so lonely, so lonely and sad real alone. Give no one, just me only, sitting on my little home. I work really hard and make up great friends, but nobody listens, no one understands. Seems like no one takes me seriously. Berlin's so lonely. lonely. Berlin's lonely. <laughs> it's really lonely. Poor little, <laughs> little Berlin. What are we gonna do? Berlin. Help. Stalin has blockaded West Berlin. It's impossible for anybody or anything to leave. Railroad streets are closed. There are two million people living in the British, the American, or the French zones. There are troops in Berlin, a small number of troops. And after about a week, we are running out of food, medicine, milk, electricity. And Truman is faced with this huge challenge. Tremendous challenge. The Soviets, the Russian bear, are closing off the city and no one can get in and no one can get out. And if you think about it, and if we were in class, we would do a brainstorm. We would kind of identify what were the different possibilities, the options, because every option, though, has certain consequences. And here are just some to get you thinking. You know, Stalin blockades the city. Truman could have said, who cares? Just let him have it. 110 miles in East, Berlin, East Germany anyways. It's going to be a pain in the butt to keep any how. But the problem is then you look weak. Remember the lesson of appeasement in the Munich conference. You don't want to look weak. You could drop an atomic bomb. We're the only country in 1948 that still has one, or the only one that has yet to get one. But the problem is you have Red Army troops throughout Eastern Europe. What if those troops go into Western Europe? You have World War III. Maybe you could send in military tanks with supplies. Maybe you can do that. But the problem is, once again, what if the Soviets respond with force? Another war. The American people don't want a war. Truman doesn't want a war. We're not prepared for war. The Soviets have the number advantage in terms of personnel. It's not like we have a stockpile of atomic bombs at this point. So Truman's faced with a very difficult decision, and Truman decides... <laughs> to order a massive airlift into Berlin. From June of 1948 to May of 1949, Truman is going to order U.S. Air Force, U.S. military to fly into the city of Berlin, fly into the city, which you could see in this image, is, is devastated still, destroyed still. For almost a year, he is going to order a massive airlift of cargo planes, at some points landing every three minutes into the city to provide supplies to the people of Berlin. It's an enormously long commitment. In fact, not only does he order those airlifts to take place, but in England over here on the map, he orders B-29 bombers that are capable of launching an atomic attack in case of a Soviet response. And this airlift, as the city is captured, planes are landing. You can see, once again, the, the crowds of German people waiting for these supplies. We've got the kids waving to the U.S. pilots. And I always love this image. They're on top of this war rubble. Remember, Berlin's still destroyed. And this kid right here, he's just smiling at the camera. Everyone else is looking at the plane. And he's like just, you know, he's, he's, he's waving. He's, he's forever in history now in this iconic image of the early part of the Cold War. I wonder if he, like, looks back. That's me. For about a year, these planes flew in, all these essential supplies. You got a kid on top of a street sign with the, the little Daisy Dukes, you know. And bringing in basic necessities, things like milk. Here you got a, an ad, milk, the new weapon of democracy providing the people of, of Germany. And this airlift, the two sides, nearly a one-year-long operation was was extremely close 
we were extremely close to, to a war. Extremely close to a war. Um, these flights flew overhead, and there's a lot of things that could have went wrong. It seems so, so simple, right? Fly planes over the blockade, land, deliver supplies, and leave. What if a plane crashed? And we thought it was the Soviets attacking the plane, and then now you have war. What if a plane is really attacked by the Soviets? Now you have war. What if Stalin extends the blockade into the sky? And so this airlift, you know, once again giving you a you know, distant perspective in terms of that. The B-29 bombers are, you know, mobilizing here. The U.S. forces and the rest of Europe are on high alert. Soviets are on high alert. The flight planes are flying into Berlin. Berlin is divided. They're landing only into the French, British, and American sectors. And this is a showdown of two of the most powerful men in 1948 and early 1949. It's basically a chess match. Who's going to come out on top. You have to guess your opponent's move. You have to anticipate what Stalin's going to do and how he's going to do it next. And just as Truman had options, Stalin had options. Here you got Stalin kind of coming out of a chimney, symbolizing the airlift through these storks, carrying things like food and coal. He could have shot planes down, but he doesn't want World War III either. He could give up Berlin, but then he looks weak. He can end the blockade, but then again, he looks weak. And after nearly a year, Stalin accepts defeat, and without really even saying much of anything, in May of 1949, he ends the blockade. And the United States uh, emerges victorious. They, they, they stood up to Stalin's aggression, and world opinion backed the United States. It made Stalin out to what he really was, which is a bully, um, bent on having Soviet spheres of influence. You can understand why he wanted them. And, but inevitably, on May 1949, uh, Stalin does surrender the blockade. And the two sides, the United States and the Soviet Union, were very close to the first armed conflict of the Cold War, actual U.S. Soviet troops engaged in, in fighting. And luckily, because of the actions of President Truman, that does not happen. Berlin will remain divided throughout the Cold War. And what will happen, though, is in May of 1949, because of what happened during the Berlin airlift, because of the, the feelings of ex increased Soviet hostility, the United States, England, and France end their occupation of Germany, and they approve the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. Germany becomes reunited into a new Western German country. The Soviets, not too long later, create their own German Democratic Republic, um, there was nothing democratic about it. It was basically run by the Communist Party with huge influence from the Soviet Union. But the consequence of the Berlin airlift... Military alliances. Has he lost his mind? Both the United States and the Soviet Union formed defensive military alliance, alliances following the Berlin Airlift. Um, and every country you see in green is eventually going to join NATO. And the ones in the red are going to belong to the Warsaw Pact. And these military alliances, in April 1949... We've got a job to do. Let's go police the world! The United States begins the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in May no, April, rather, in 1949. Ten nations are the first to adopt it, including the United States and countries, England, France, West Germany. And NATO is a hugely important alliance. It is a huge break from the way we have done things in foreign policy previously because it is the first time the United States is in a peaceful military alliance. We are no longer isolationists after this treaty. Not to say that we were before it, but now there is this belief that, that if one country in NATO is attacked, we will come to the aid and the defense of that country. We are, even though not at war, 
we belong to this organization, NATO, the end of U.S. isolationism. In fact, Congress gives over a billion dollars in military assistance to countries We've got a job to do. Let's go police the world! That belong to NATO. In fact, you could take a look on this um, graphic right here, the countries that will belong to NATO, and some are at it later on. Um, NATO is, is something that is still an important part of, of international politics. But NATO forms. Stalin replies with his own um, version of a military alliance. We've got a job to do. Let's go police the world. And the Soviet Union is going to create the Warsaw Pact. And the Warsaw Pact is, is a rival military alliance. Uh, it's created a little bit later on, but it is the Soviet Union, which all of this red territory is the Soviets. Huge country and many of those countries in Eastern Europe. And once again, an attack on one of them was considered an attack on all. And what's important to keep in mind is the United States, Soviet Union, by the late 1940s, Europe was divided into two armed camps. You have two sides. The world was becoming bipolar in the sense of two different sides. And on one end was the communist Soviets, and on the other was the United States. And this is just the beginning of what will be a many decades long Cold War.